Hi everyone! My name is Valerie and I am the Outreach Coordinator for Future Energy Systems. The book we're reading today is Science Comics, Cars, Engines That Move You, and it's written and illustrated by Dan Zetwalk. And we're going to be reading this in four parts, so welcome to part one! Stroke one, intake, prehistory of cars, daybreak, August 1888, Germany. Alright boys, ready to push? Hop up, let's go! Bertha Benz is headed to her mother's house with her sons, but this is no ordinary trip. Vroom! It's the first car ride in history, Bertha's drive. Dear Carl, the boys and I have left for Fortsheim. Don't worry, we'll send telegrams from our journey. Love always, Bertha. Carl Benz is a struggling engineer trying to get some notice for his new invention, the Benz Patton Motor Wagon. Carl's wife, Bertha, takes matters into her own hands and drives the gas-powered contraption the world has never seen out into the countryside. Will it make the 194-kilometer round-trip voyage? The family and their alien motorcraft attract a lot of attention. Here they are refilling the gas tank at a village pharmacy. <gasps> it's a devil's carriage! What? We're just going to see Grandma! It's a bumpy ride, but Bertha gets resourceful. She has a cobbler nail leather to the brakes, inventing brake pads. The boys often have to help push up hills, but they complete the trip, helping jumpstart a revolution. Benz will become one of the biggest names in car manufacturing. Let's put it in reverse. Millions of years ago. Fire is a natural part of life on Earth from the beginning. It is harnessed as best as possible by early humans. But it isn't until much later that we learn to create and control our own fire. Fire provides warmth, a way to cook food, and protection. What exactly is fire? Fire is the visible effect of combustion. It occurs when oxygen and fuel meet at a really high temperature. A chain reaction that creates heat, flame, and smoke is ignited. A way to visualize combustion is the fire triangle, which includes an oxidizer, usually oxygen found in air, fuel, gasoline, coal, wood, and heat, the sun, friction, other fires, etc. Chemical chain reactions sustain the fire. When all the pieces are present, we have combustion. Complete combustion burns cleanly with minimal byproducts. Incomplete combustion releases partially burnt carbon or toxic gases. More on that later. Switching gears from chemistry to physics, let's talk about the six simple machines. Originated in ancient Greece and fine-tuned during the Renaissance, these devices use mechanical advantage to move the world. A lever, a bar on a fulcrum for leveraging weight. Inclined plane, an angled surface for raising or lowering a load. Wedge, a triangular tool for separating, lifting, or holding. Screw, converts rotational force to linear force. Pulley, a grooved wheel for raising or lowering weight. Wheel and axle, a disc with a rod through it for amplifying force. Which brings us to the history of the wheel. The wheel is not found in nature. It had to be invented. There are microscopic bacteria with tiny spinning flagella, but those are more like corkscrews. We think of the wheel as a primitive invention, but it comes along fairly late, well after things like the canoe, bronze, the flute, silk shirts. The first known wheel dates from 3500 BCE, but it isn't even used for transport. Then there's the Ljubljana Marsh's wheel, circa 3000 BC, which brings us to another prehistoric artifact from Central Europe, the Bronosis pot. The Bronosis pot, circa 3400 BCE, appears to depict a four-wheeled cart led by animals hauling a load. It's the earliest known image of a wheeled vehicle. Inscribed on the pot is a poem written in code. Wheels have had prominent roles in religions throughout history. Wheels are made lighter weight and faster around 2000 BCE with the invention of spokes. The smooth riding pneumatic tire with its inner tube inflated with air is popularized in 1888. Horsepower. We can't get to cars without talking about horses specifically their domestication by humans. Tooth fossils suggest that pet horses are being trained to pull things as early as 4000 BCE. We know that by 2500 BCE, they are important for agriculture, transport, and especially warfare. 
By 2000 BCE, elaborate chariot burials are common. We begin to see how much drivers love their vehicles. 1323 BCE, ancient Egypt sees the ultimate wheel and horse combo, King's Tut war chariot, the Ferrari of antiquity, early high performance machine with luxury handling. King Tut, teenage pharaoh, dies at age 19. Some historians think that he's killed in a chariot race wreck. Personal transport. In addition to warfare, chariots are used for important funerals. Or you could use one for hunting or simply getting around town if you're rich. Chariot racing becomes popular in ancient Greek, Roman, and Byzantine cultures. Many fans go just to see the spectacular crashes. A spectacle in medieval times is the traveling biblical theater known as the pageant wagon. We have vehicles start to be called carriages. The coach, named after Hungarian town coach, becomes the most popular carriage thanks to its smooth ride. Meanwhile, in America, the dominant form of travel is still the more rugged covered wagon. All these vehicles still have the same power source. Horsepower becomes a unit of measurement of power, supposedly based on the strength of a horse. It's a marketing gimmick with little relation to the real horse, but it will be used for years to come. Combining chemical reactions and mechanical movements, it's the age of steam-powered vehicles. 1670, Father Ferdinand Verbiest, a priest in China, designs a steam-powered toy that many call the world's first automobile. 1769, French Army Captain Nicolas Joseph Cugnot, Cugnot's Fadier à Vapeur, a big slow tricycle, is the first working steam-powered vehicle. It's also history's first car wreck. 1801, British engineer Richard Trevithick's Puffing Devil is the first road locomotive to carry a passenger. It pioneers dangerous high-pressure steam. 1805, American Oliver Evans' Orcter Amphibolus is a large steam-powered mutant meant to work on land and water. Reports of its success vary. 1813, Scottish inventor William Brutton's odd steam horse is pushed along by mechanical legs. 1829, Englishman Robert Stevenson's rocket is the first major steam train. 1860s to the 1910s, steam-powered cars become mechanically and commercially viable and seem ready to take over the world. Boiling point. Here's how a typical steam-powered car works. It has a water tank, boiler, piano wires, steam, cylinders, pistons, combustion, burner, and rear axle. Advantages of steam cars over emerging gas-powered cars, which we'll get to soon, are quieter and smoother engines, better fuel efficiency, kinder to the environment, faster acceleration. Disadvantages, water tank must be continually refilled for longer drives, burner must be lit by hand, it might take 20 minutes to build boiler pressure even longer when cold outside. In 1899, William McKinley is the first U.S. president to ride in a car, a locomobile steamer. He expresses some hesitation. I appreciate the invitation, Mr. Stanley, but are you sure the contraption is safe? You have my word. There will not be the slightest danger. Afterward, he remarks, Stanley is over-optimistic, I think, when he says those things will someday replace horses. But it won't be McKinley's last car ride. After being shot in 1901, he is transported by an electric ambulance. The golden age of the steam car has run out of steam. Let's back up a bit. Engines are defined as a machine that produces movement. But how do they work in theory? Nicolas Leonard Cédit Carnot. This young French military engineer spends his days dreaming of abstract concepts. Hmm, maybe heat is like a waterfall. Is the work available from a heat source potentially unbounded? Can heat engines be improved by replacing the steam with some other working fluid or gas? The Carnot heat engine. He develops a model showing that when heat is moved from a hot place to a cool place, some of it can be turned into work. It just needs to pass through an engine. This simple idea is the basis for most future engines, Although unknown at the time, Carnot is considered the father of thermodynamics. 
Energy is the invisible fuel that drives the universe. Thermodynamics is the branch of science that deals with energy and its products, heat, work, and power. The important second law of thermodynamics states, it's impossible to convert heat into work with 100% efficiency. There is always waste energy. Every energy transformation creates more randomness in the universe. You can't unscramble an egg. This irreversible process only flows in one direction. This is how we can tell the past from the future. This is the arrow of time. Of course Carnot's super efficient idealized heat engine is all in his head. Don't try installing one in your car. It'll give you great gas mileage, but you won't get very far. Next, let's move from the theoretical engines to the real ones. Loud, filthy, stinky, and gigantic. Whether you're racing a fire-breathing hot rod down the drag strip or cruising a minivan through the suburbs, you've got one engine to thank, the auto engine. It is the earliest common ancestor all modern engines share. It's invented by Nicholas Otto, a German grocery salesman turned engineer. 1876, after 14 years of blood, sweat, and gears, Otto and his team succeeds. He has built arguably the first internal combustion engine. What makes the auto engine special is that it compresses air and fuel inside the engine cylinder where the explosion is sparked. It's the first true four-stroke engine and it works great. The new engine spreads quickly. It is licensed or copied by manufacturers around the world. Two auto engines power the lights at the re rededication of the Cologne Cathedral. 1880, Otto's two right-hand men Daimler and Maybach angrily leave the company. They want to make the engines small enough to fit in cars, but Otto wants to focus on factories. Ironically, Otto has no interest in transportation. 1882. Police raid a mysterious greenhouse in Cannstatt, Germany. Bank robbers? Counterfeiters? It's Gottlieb Daimler and Wilhelm Maybach burning the midnight oil, working on their dream engine, one small enough for a vehicle. Soon they complete the revolutionary grandfather clock engine. They are finally ready to get moving. 1885, the Daimler Petroleum Weitwagen riding car is built. Daimler is often called the father of the motorcycle for this gnarly invention, though my Maybach is certainly a co-inventor. Daimler and Maybach also motorize a canoe. They start putting engines on old horse-drawn coaches, but will soon build four-wheelers from scratch. Meanwhile, 96 kilometers away, Carl Benz is working independently on his own original motor car. Not to be forgotten, obscure antecedents and evolutionary dead ends in early car making. The earliest explosion engines were modeled on cannons, 1808. Francois Isaac de Rivez adds a cannon-like engine to a carriage. 1824, Samuel Brown's gas vacuum engine seems to work, but it is just too darn costly. 1863, Etienne Lenoir's hippomobile is as large as a hippopotamus, but much slower. 1864-70, Siegfried Marcus, an Austrian inventor of Jewish descent, designs a gas-powered motor cart. It never goes into production. He is better known for his dynamite-blasting Weiner Zunder. 1872. George Brayton's ready motor starts quickly and runs on constant pressure. 1879-95. to George B. Selden's patents patents the automobile in the U.S. starting legal wars that would last decades. Selden never builds a single car. 1893, the Duryea brothers build the first American cars and later loan one to the Barnum and Bailey Circus. 1896, Henry Ford, a young tinkerer from a farm family, finishes his homemade quadricycle. Soon he'll be one of the richest people on the planet. Nineteen hundred, the gasoline-powered engine is becoming standard. Most early engines are in the middle or back of the car and connect to the rear wheels. Here is an x-ray view into the basic anatomy of an internal combustion engine. The beating heart of the engine contains two simple parts, the cylinder and the piston. 
Cylinder, hollow tube shaped space sealed to be nearly airtight. Piston, piece of metal that is pushed up and down in the cylinder. The cylinder and piston work with the connecting rod and crankshaft to transfer mechanical energy from the engine to the rest of the car. Connecting rod, connects the piston to the crankshaft. Crankshaft, rotating shaft that turns the pistons up and down motion into rotational motion like bicycle pedals. Early cars like Benz and Daimler have just one cylinder. The quadricycle has two. Future cars will have several. But without air, fuel, and heat, the engine is just a bunch of interconnected hunks of useless metal. Here's how we get it moving. Air fuel mixture, gasoline vapor, is sucked into the cylinder. We now have two of the three ingredients needed for combustion. Valves open and close the holes in the cylinder. The intake valve allows stuff in. The exhaust valve allows stuff out. At precisely the right moment, the spark plug will zap electricity into the cylinder, igniting the mixture and BOOM! But that isn't happening quite yet. The air and fuel are still filling the cylinder. Let's take a step-by-step -step look. How it works. The four-stroke internal combustion engine. One explosion won't get you very far. You need thousands of explosions happening repeatedly in sequence just to drive down the street to grab lunch. Here are the four steps, or strokes, in the engine cycle. One, intake. Air fuel vapor mixture is sucked into the cylinder. Piston moves from the top of the cylinder to the bottom. Crankshaft and wheels start are turning. Step two, compression. Inertia carries piston back to the top of the cylinder. Air fuel mixture is crunched together, becoming highly pressurized. Otto is the one who figured out this crucial step. I still don't care for transport. Step three, power. The spark plug zaps the volatile mixture, causing it to combust. The piston flies back down the cylinder, turning the crankshaft. Imagine the fuse of a cannon being lit, then exploding. Only the cannonball, the piston, doesn't fly out of the cannon. It keeps pumping up and down, powering your car. Step four, exhaust. Piston moves back up, pushing water vapor and carbon dioxide out of the cylinder. After this step, new air fuel flows in and the process repeats forever. Or at least until you get lunch. Or run out of gas. And that was part one of Science Comics, Cars, Engines That Move You. Can you believe how much cars have changed since they were invented? Who knows what they'll be like a hundred years from now? Make sure you check out the next three parts of the story and the activities below. We'll see you soon. Bye! Thank you so much for watching Future Energy Systems video. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of our exciting content. Check out the links below to our website and learning page where you can find activities, learning extension, and more. You can also sign up on the website for notifications for future videos and interactive opportunities. There's so much to learn as we explore our energy future.